uh, to make uh, all of the, many of the folks that came into the mommy store uh, were, you know, just blown away. experience every year. Uh, if you're joining the line, what we are talking about is every year our village here in Gold Hill, North Carolina has a lighting of fall fires and it goes way back in history and um, it's it was last night and um, if you ever find yourself on the Saturday before Thanksgiving with nothing to do, contact us because we have contact in the congregation, we can get you tickets, and it will be worth your while. You will really, really enjoy it. It, it, is, a, it, it is a beautiful night um, in the village. Um, I am Pastor Beverly in Gold Hill, and we appreciate you joining us. I appreciate all of you being here in the pews. It's, it's nice to see live faces. Um, I, I, I hope that I have kept everyone updated on Hoppy, um, but we do have a serious prayer request for our uh, church member, Hoppy Hopkins. He had an accident. He fell, slipped off of his step and just hit the concrete patio really hard. Vivian is now on her way back up to Wake Forest. And my understanding, some of y'all may have got to talk to her last night, David did, um, that she's just, it, I don't think they really exactly know exactly what, because things seemed to change every 30 minutes. She would send me a text, and then I'd get another text, and it had changed. And, um, but I think there's going to be no surgery. They're going to try to do physical therapy on him at the hospital. Then he'll be released to rehab and then home, but he can't put weight on it. Because of where it is fractured, it's almost impossible to get in there and do any surgery on it. So we need to keep Hoppy lifted for a while. I also got a prayer request just a few, just now almost from Mona, our sister church member up in Maryland, who is very faithful. She watches us every Sunday and she, um, she shares her gifts and tithes and offerings with us. She has asked for a prayer for her friend, G. And this is going to be ongoing, so if you will put this in your prayer journal. Um, she has bone cancer. And, and Mona is asking that we pray that um, this will be resolved. And... I probably should read exactly what she wrote, but her she's going to be having surgery in December, and uh, she says, would you pray for healing and that the cancer will be stripped and have no hold on her in the future? So if we could remember G and, and pray, pray for the cancer. And that's the same prayer I have for Graham. Um, I'm still praying for a miracle that Graham will be stripped from his cancer, that God's healing hand will fall on him. And we still have church members that are battling cancer, and we, we want to remember all of them. Are there any other uh, joys or concerns for the congregation this morning? Thank you, Bill. <laughs> yes, we do love hearing that bell ringing again. That's how old is the bell, Darius? Is it? Oh, well, it's uh, from the original church, which dates back uh, 18, 
Is it from 1883 or is that just when it was put here? Well, I think it, it arrived when the church was moved, uh, but I, I'm not sure about that. Honestly. So it's old. <laughs> it's old. We do love hearing it. Okay, Carolyn, have you got any word for anybody? Her birthday's Friday. Everybody send Carolyn a card, call her, and sing to her on Friday. <laughs> we have to remember her birthday. Um, if there are no, uh, the, I have shoe boxes. There's some up here just to kind of remind you, but there's some in the back, and I've got some more that I just didn't bring in this morning. Um, I will send out a list of what needs to go in the shoe boxes. And I, we're really late doing this right now. So if you want to do this, just make a point in your head that they need to probably be filled um, this week or next. I will get all that information and I will email that out to you, what to put in them and when I need them back to take to Epworth to get to Charlotte. Um, anything else? David, if I got it covered. If there is nothing else, uh, we do have prayers from the prayer shed. Um, there are Caroline's having family issues and Kevin has hurt his hip and he's having family issues and Leslie wants to get uh, well from surgery because she fell and Leslie Clark is having surgery for cancer and um, this one I don't know who it's from dear Lord thank you for this day with this person so God knows who that all is. So we will pray for those in just a moment. If you are able, will you stand and join us for the prayer of illumination? This is Christ the King Sunday. This is the last Sunday of the Christian year. And we will be reflecting on the life of Christ. Next Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent. And that is the first Sunday of the Christian year. So let us pray this prayer of illumination on this last Sunday of our Christian year. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the Scriptures are read and in the word of the mind, we may hear your joy what you say as far as I said. Amen. And we will be singing verses 1 and 3 on page 715 for our call. from Colossians chapter 1 and I know the bulletin says verses 9 through 12 but I'm going to be reading through 15. For this reason since the day that we heard it we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives that are worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God 
May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and has transformed us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And if you will join me in our affirmation of faith, our Apostles' Creed, on page 881, I believe in God. bow your heads and join me in prayer. O oh, loving Father, you created all of the universes, many universes we have not, the scientists have not even found yet, but they know they're out there. You are so majestic that we do not have human words to lift up and praise your holy name. We come together on this Christ the King Sunday, remembering that Jesus didn't just start in the New Testament. He has always, he was with you during creation. He was with you crossing the desert. The Holy Spirit and Jesus and Father God are one. And, and we are blessed that we understand that even though we don't understand it. We know that you are three separate beings, but you are one God. And we are so humbled to come before your presence, especially on this day where we recognize our loving Savior that left the throne of heaven to come down and become human and to teach us and to reach us and, and to fulfill all of the promises that were made in the Old Testament so that we can be here today with you, worshiping with one another, Father, we ask forgiveness for sins that we have committed some intentionally, some just happened and we really didn't mean to do it. And then, Father, I know that there are sins we commit sometimes that we just don't know. We don't know sometimes when we hurt somebody. We don't know sometimes that our word just pierced them to their soul. We don't know sometimes when we don't make a phone call that, that someone was waiting for 
that, that they, their heart hurt just a little bit. We don't know sometimes when our actions or our words have brought pain to someone. So for all the sins we've committed that we do not know about, we ask forgiveness for those. And then the next time that it's about to happen, Lord, we ask that you put a little heartburn in us so that we will reach out to that person, so we will not say a word that hurts or cuts to the core, so that we will always speak kindness and love. Help us, Father, to be kinder and gentler people as we go through the day. Help us always to have you first and foremost in our minds, because the one thing we do know is that we are always on your mind. And you are always more willing to hear us than we are to stop our busyness and be with you. So forgive us, Father, for the sins we know about, but especially those we've committed that have brought pain that we don't know about. <clears throat> Father, help us as we walk through your life this morning to remember that it wasn't always easy for you, that you had to go to God and you had to beg him to keep you in his will, which I just find just, I can't even wrap my mind around you needing power to stay in your father's will. But you were always willing because you loved us so much. So help us to be worthy of that love, Lord. Help us to tell the story. Help us to be the disciples that when you did ascend from heaven, that you commanded us to go make disciples of all nations. Help us to pray for our enemies. Help us to pray for that person that said a caustic word to us and hurt our heart. Help us to remember that you forgave those that put you on the cross, that beat you and tortured you so terribly. Help us to forgive those that hurt our heart with the same spirit that you forgave all of us. Father, we pray that this morning, as we hear your word, as we sing your songs, as we meditate and sit quietly with you, that we remember those that we need to pray for, but mostly that we just settle in and that when we leave this place today, we will know that we have seen your face. I ask you to anoint each and every heart that is here. Anoint our music, anoint the prayers, anoint the message. Help us to be better, to be different when our time together in this holy hour comes to an end. And Father, at this time, we take a moment to lift up to you those prayers that we just cannot share with others and to remember those that we have been asked to pray for and to give to you our personal sins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, we especially lift up this morning Shirley and Glenna and John <clears throat> as we miss them in our congregation. We lift up Graham and Lindsay and Lamar and Mac as they are fighting disease in their body. We lift up Hoppy for great healing and that he will be able to do as the doctors say. It's going to be hard 
for him to be still for six weeks. And Lord, I, I ask prayers for Vivian as she is on the road traveling back up to Winston to be with him, to keep her safe. I ask you to be with all of those that are unable to be with us this morning, wherever they are, that they are safe and that they are hearing your word somewhere. God, we thank you for our prayer shed and we lift up all of these prayers that were given to us. We lift up Caroline and her family. We lift up Kevin and his family and the issues they are going through. We lift up Leslie, who's getting ready to have surgery because she fell. And we lift up Leslie Clark, who's gonna have to have surgery for cancer. Father, there is a lot of illness in, in our community. We lift up all of those around us, some of them closer than we can imagine that are struggling with addiction. Father, these are children that you love. Help us to always pray for them and show us how to love them as you want us to, to help them to find a better place and turn their life around. Father, we know it is your will that everyone is healthy and everyone is working in your kingdom. And we do not know what to do but to pray. And sometimes we don't even know what to pray. And so I ask, Father, for all of our hearts, Holy Spirit, I ask you just to come down now and search our hearts and take the desires and the longings and the pain of our hearts. Take it to God and translate it into the perfect language so that he knows our, what, what we're trying to say in our human words that we just cannot make sound like what maybe God needs to hear. Search our hearts, O oh Lord, and know that we are more than just our fumbling and bumbling human ways and actions and words. But God, you did teach us the perfect prayer so as brothers and sisters, we come together and we speak this beautiful prayer, meaning every word of it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth. Father, open our hearts to give back to you what you gave to us in the very beginning. Amen. <laughs>
Christians. Remember, he started by telling them that he prays for them. He prays for them often. And, and um, he is trying to get them grounded solidly in the basics of faith and to make sure that Christ is in the very center of that faith that they have. You know, this has not been too long after Jesus died and ascended. Some of these people had never seen Jesus. And so Paul is trying to bring him fresh and anew. He's trying to catch them before their faith starts wavering. He's, he's trying to grab hold of them before they wander away from this new thing that they have just found, that, that Jesus planted deep into their heart before they get tired, before they forget the story, before they forget the joy of that moment where they first found Jesus. And he's trying to do the same for you and I. He's telling us, remember your story. Remember the past. There's a lot of good, but there's a lot of bad back there. Remember your past, but don't keep looking back at it. Look forward to your future. It's kind of like the, the car you drive, you've got a little tiny mirror to look behind you, but you've got a great big windshield to look and see where you're going. And we've got a great, great, big, beautiful, clear windshield right here to see where we're going. So Paul says, look forward. I think this is a very important message for early Christians and for us today on this Christ the King Sunday, to remember, to remember Christ in the past. As we take this Sunday and we reflect where our faith all began, we have to remember the past. And then possibly check our hearts. Where are we today? Do we, do we remember um, th this story or has it become stale in our hearts? Is it just another thing, like getting up and having a cup of coffee? You just do it every day. When we think of Christ and his mission and his entire being, do we remember that that mission began way back in the beginning, way before Genesis ever happened, way before the creation? There is so much more to Jesus than just the 33 years that he spent on this earth. But we try to nail him down to that time period, and, and especially those last three years of his life. So who is this Jesus? Who is this king we call the high priest? Who is this man, this God-man, that showed up 2,000 years ago after... 5, 10, 20,000 years of chaos on our earth. Paul understood all of this, and, and he's trying to give the Colossians a history review <clears throat> because God knew that one day all of us were going to need to hear this again, and we're going to need to hear it in a fresh new light, and we're going to have to think about it a little bit differently. Because when you grow up going to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and mom brings you to church every Sunday, it, it becomes ingrained in you. And it's like that police officer that started his journey as a policeman because he wanted to help people. He wanted to take care of people. Then he saw so much he became jaded and his heart changed. Still wants to help people, still wants to be a policeman. But his heart's a little bit different than it was 15 years ago when he went on the force. And, and Paul doesn't want us to get stale, like a stale loaf of bread that's been sitting on the counter. So he's trying very hard to, to fill these, these Christians. I think his goal was before he died to make sure all these early Christians understood and knew and believed these brand new true beliefs, this new thing Jesus had done. So that the untrue beliefs, and this is what's important, so that the untrue beliefs will not find lodging in their hearts. And we need that same lesson. 
We need, we need to understand that just because we call on the name of Jesus, that doesn't mean that Satan's not waiting for a weak moment. And, and Paul is wanting them to understand that if we can hold to the truth, if we can remember this story, then when the lies of the world tempt us, and they will, they're not going to be able to take root in our heart. And that's what Paul is saying. He's not saying we're going to live a perfect life. He's not saying that we're never going to see evil. He's just saying, don't let it take up residence in your heart. Use the power of Jesus to exhort it from you. Have an exorcism of your heart, so to speak. I have a question. What, what keeps a little country church thriving for years and years and years when all those years people keep moving away People keep moving in with Jesus. People keep getting older and sick and unable to attend church anymore. But yet the church goes on. And what keeps a man that, that joined his heart with Jesus, but he's gotten out of the habit of prayer. He's gotten out of the habit of reading his Bible. He's gotten out of the habit of sharing time with God. And his prayers, if he does pray, that might be rote at best. And he's unable or unwilling to even attend the church that he used to come to. But he still calls himself a Christian. Some of these people that are just going day to day and even showing up in the pews... Some of these Christians, and I include myself, are what Jesus calls lukewarm Christians and lukewarm churches. And Jesus promised us before he ascended to heaven, and if you go and read Revelation, and maybe one day we'll do a study on that, but Jesus promised that when these lukewarm Christians come to him, that he will spit them out of his mouth. And Paul doesn't want any of us spit out. And so he tells us again how it all began. He tells us again of this new thing. He's trying to revive our hearts and our souls. And he doesn't leave out the scary parts. And he tells it over and over. And he tells them again about the redeeming love of Christ for all. Not just for the Jews, but the Gentiles for everyone. And before Paul gets into the instruction that I just read to you, before he gets into that, the first thing that he said in the scripture is, we pray for you. Because they too, even though they are lukewarm or maybe are forgetting their experience and the joy and the love they had for Christ, they love the Spirit. And, and they are faithful ministers to Jesus Christ. And so he prays for them. And he prays for us. And listen to the prayer that he prayed. He prays for wisdom. He prays for knowledge. He prays that they will be filled with the will and the Spirit of God so that they might live a life worthy of the Lord, a life pleasing to God and bearing good fruit of good work while continuing to grow in the knowledge of God. Now, I think that's a pretty powerful prayer. And I wonder... If we got up every morning and we prayed for wisdom and knowledge and, and for all hearts to be filled with the Spirit of God so that we could all be worthy, what if we prayed this prayer over one another every day and ourselves? What, what would look different in this community, in our families, in our church? I, I just think that's... that's, that's if you don't pray anything else, if you could just go to Colossians chapter 1 and read the prayer of Paul, I believe that things could be different. And he prayed that we would all be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might. 
so that we might have great endurance and patience. And, and every time I read that, I don't care who wrote it, if it's Paul or Timothy, I don't care who wrote it, every time I read those two words, endurance and patience, I, I, I feel like I just got a little thorn in my heart. I feel like somebody just pricked me a little bit because I get tired. I don't know about y'all, but I get tired and I don't feel like I got the endurance for the race. But worse than that, I get impatient. I run out of patience with David. I run out of patience with my family. I run out of patience with, with my children and grandchildren. And, and so when I read that, that I'm supposed to have great patience, I say, Paul, but you don't know me. You don't know what, what I'm living through. You don't understand the world of today. But we know that that's not true. We know God, when he gave Paul these words, he knew what we were going to be facing today. Do we understand <clears throat> this power that Paul was talking about here, this power that Paul is praying for for each of us? We use these words in our Christian liturgy every day. God is powerful. He is the most powerful. He is the only God. He is the King of Kings. That's why we've got Christ the King Sunday. But God dispenses that power to all of us who believe in Him. Is there anyone in here who believes that they can pray? I'm not going to no, raise your hands. But, but do you believe that, that God has dispensed upon you the power to pray illness out of a person? Because he did. We did that not long ago with Hoppy. We've done that. I, I've been a part of miracles in this community many times. God promised us that power. We have to claim it. We have to be, he chose us. He chose us to believe in him and to serve him. And he is going to give us the power we need to do that. And for this word power, the Greek word that Paul was using here is dynamis. And, and dynamis is, is the Greek word for power that means to accomplish things. It is an active word for power. It is talking about positive power that, that can be done. And it denotes the kind of courage that is found in that active, positive power. And, and the early disciples understood this word. And, and they understood that, that they could possibly face great persecution because Paul had. But, and so Paul is reminding them that God has given them the power to endure and the courage to face any enemy without flinching. And so Paul wants us to be strengthened with that kind of kingdom-building, courageous power. We do not have to worry about walking down the streets and a Roman soldier grabbing us and taking us and giving us 39 lashes because we believe in Jesus. But we do need the kind of active, courageous power to go out and be disciples and kingdom builders for God. And it's not just out of this world power, but it's power that um, is, is according to the might of God. We have to remember that God's glory is so powerful that he couldn't even re let Moses you know, one of the most important people in the Old Testament. He couldn't even let Moses see his face. He came in a burning bush. But then um, when, when Moses was on the mountain, he couldn't let him see his face. Biblical writers, um, I've read, attempting to describe God's glory using human words. They, they portrayed it as a devouring fire. And that's in Exodus 24, 17. But then if you go and read Exodus 33, when Moses asked God to see God's glory, God replied, you cannot see my face. No one can see me and live. But then he went on to say, but you see right here by me, there's, there's a place in the rock 
And, and I, I want you to stand right there while my glory passes by you. And I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will put my hand over your face and, until I have passed by. And then I will take away my hand and you will see my back. But my face will never be seen. The point is that God's glory is so overwhelming that humans just are not engineered to be capable of experiencing it. An analogy might be made that um, coming into contact with a live high voltage wire and, and getting electrocuted, that's too much for us. That might be like looking at the glory, at the face of God. We just wouldn't be able to deal with it, and we would probably just fall dead as if we had been electrocuted. Remember the glory and the beauty of the creation. God spoke his word into darkness, and there was light. And in, in this beginning of this story, this is where Jesus begins, the Christ the king, the one that loved us so much that he gave himself for our redemption. This is what Paul wants the Colossians to remember, and he wants us to never forget. This is the story he wants us to never stop telling. From the beginning to the end, in the beginning there was nothing, and our amazing God began creating. The Father spoke, the Word obeyed, and the Spirit hovered. Jesus is the one that gives light and life to all of creation. For him, it is life. It's, it's Jesus, the, his name is almost synonymous with life, but it's an abundant life. It's not life as you and I know. Jesus is the Word of God. And at the beginning of creation, when the world was non-existent, God spoke life into a dead world with His Word, Jesus, saying, let there be light. And the light of Jesus shone. And Jesus was that light. And Jesus was that life. Jesus was what enlightened the world through himself, and God's creation received life and light to function in the image of God. Jesus is the one that brings the beauty of God into our lives. He gives us life. He gives us light to light up our lives with the goodness and the presence of God. John 1, 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So when Paul tells the Colossians and us to be strengthened by the power and the glory of God, he means it. He means all of this, the whole story, from the glory of the creation that Father spoke into the darkness, the Son that brought light into the darkness, and the Spirit that hovered over the waters and brought life to earth. The God that had to cover the face of Moses so he wouldn't get electrocuted as he passed by. The kind of powerful glory that led the Israelites out of slavery. That kind of glory that arrived in a little town in Bethlehem, in a manger, and, and like any other messy, bloody human birth. And I ask, where is the glory in that? There is great glory there because this little baby would grow strong in stature and grace. He will honor his heavenly Father well. and He will remain obedient and faithful to the glory of the cross. But his greatest glory will be seen by the disciples that are going to find him three days after the cross. And finally, all the stories that have been told for thousands and thousands of years to God's people are going to make sense. The man of sorrows was the God of glory. So Paul prayed. He prayed that, that all would live a life worthy of this God of this Father, of this Christ, and of this Spirit, and that we would all be strengthened by that glory. And why? The end of verse 11 that I wrote, read to you a few minutes ago tells us that you may have great endurance and patience 
giving joy to the Father. Having great endurance and patience. I've already told you how I feel about that. No one in the Bible experienced greater pain and adversity than Paul, except for Jesus, in my opinion. And so Paul was speaking from experience when he was talking about pain and adversity. <clears throat> he knew about the trials of this life. And he knew what the possibilities were that these people would face. And he understood that the Colossians were Gentiles and that they were persecuted by the Romans and the Jews. The Jews were persecuted by the Romans, but the Gentiles are being persecuted by both. And we believe that, that we struggle in our hard times in life, and all of us have hard times, one or another. But most of us, if you think about it in context, most of us have lived the lives of kings and queens compared to the early Christians or to the house Christians of today that are meeting in basements in communist countries. Or the Christians we saw in 2020 that were lined up on the beach as ISIS beheaded every one of them. We don't have that fear in the village of Gold Hill. But we do have trials. We do have tribulations. And Paul is trying to tell these early Colossian Christians who he knew were certain to suffer with adversities, that they were going to have to be tough to survive. And friends, I say that we might not have the physical tortures, we don't have the physical fears, we're not going to be thrown to the lions, but we have fears because Satan knows that we're not going to be punished by Roman soldiers. And so he tries to get into our hearts and get into our life and these are the adversities that the 21st century Christians are facing. We are in a spiritual warfare, and it is constant. And, and it will creep into your life when you least expect it. And you only take one action on your part or one word on, from you that is in agreement with Satan to totally tear up what you have built with Christ and you feel like you have to almost start over again. So he knew that they were going to have to be physically tough to survive. And we have Christians today that have got to be physically tough to survive. We have got people living around us that are just one, one overdose away from death. They have to be physically tough to survive. They need someone by their side. We have children not that far from us that are hungry, whose parents have more important things to do than to take care of them. That's physically tough. A six-year-old child shouldn't be wondering where his or her supper's coming from. I've been hearing all week, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. I've been hearing all week of the petty little travails of trying to get a ticket to a Taylor Swift concert. You would think that China just dropped a bomb on everyone under the age of 30. With all the weeping and wailing I have seen going on over a jammed up ticket master and wait time to get these tickets. What if you had, I, I, in, in listening to these stories on the news, I, I, I thought, you know, my brain always works different than everybody's, but I'm, I'm just thinking, these people are going to do anything to get that ticket. And, and, and they've already, they've already AOC is, is wanting the government to get in and get busy and straighten this out because she wants to go see Taylor Swift. And, and she's, she's blaming the government on it. I'm thinking, what if we got that much angst? What if we had that much trouble getting a copy of the Bible? 
Would, would, would we get on TV? Would we go to the news? Would we say, I need a Bible? I can't find one. What if, what if you had to t have a ticket to get into church on Sunday morning and Ticketmaster blew up? Would you fight to get a seat to come in here on Sunday mornings? I have listened to just enough of this Taylor Swift issue and I think, oh my gosh, we moan and we groan about the silliest, stupidest, pettiest stuff in the world. The professor of the class that I'm taking right now, he has told us that he loses his mind when he's on the interstate and somebody passes him and that he reacts very badly. And I'm thinking, you're a professor, you are a pastor, and you let somebody passing you on the interstate have that kind of control over your thinking? I don't know. I don't think these are the kind of troubles that Paul is thinking about. When I think about what Paul's talking about, I think of my nephew and his family and what they go through every day, wondering, is this the last or is a miracle coming? I think of Vivian up by Hoppy's side when he fell Friday, not knowing what was going to happen next. Those are troubles. I think of our shut-ins and their loneliness sometimes. And, and, I, and I, I think of troubles. I don't think about wanting a ticket for a Taylor Swift concert or somebody passing me on the highway. Paul wants us to react to these trials, to these kind of sufferings, these, these prayer requests on the back of your bulletin, these prayer requests right here in our prayer shed. Paul wants us to, to react to these kind of moments with the power and the glory of God to endure the hardships so that we can give joyful thanks to the Lord. Do you understand? We are supposed to be joyful for the cancer, joyful for that stillborn baby, joyful for a failed marriage, Joyful thanks for the loss of a job. Joyful in all of these things. We are to give thanks with joy. Remember Christ the King. He could have just stayed up there on his royal throne, but he loved us too much to do that. Remember his glorious power of the King that came down. Remember the power of God that had to hide his face from Moses, his number one man, so that he wouldn't get electrocuted. Remember the young unmarried girl that had to go and tell her mama and her daddy and her fiancé that she was pregnant. Remember that messy birth. And then remember the glorious tomb. And remember it all. With pure joy, Paul says, Paul knew the hardships that they were going through and he told them to endure and that he would pray for them, that they wouldn't have to go through it alone because Jesus was with them. And he wasn't talking about just gritting your teeth endurance. He wants us to endure it all with joy. And I know that is, just seems like an impossibility at times. But on this last Sunday in this Christian year, I ask you all to count it all joy. The fall from the garden, the flood that took away everyone but Noah and his family, the exodus across the desert, and then finally the cross and the empty tomb. Remember it all with joy, my friends, and tell the story. Tell of the glory and the love of God, our Christ, our King, our Holy Spirit that never leaves us. Tell it all and remember it. And next Sunday, we're going to start a new year, our first Sunday in Advent. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. If you are able, will you stand and let's crown our King of Kings with many, many crowns.
courage to be your kingdom builder and go with us as we leave this place to remember Jesus came for one reason, to redeem us all, that we will stand by his side one day in your presence. Amen.